Well, instead of telling you what's happening, I want to show it to you in a way that you will probably never forget. So I've asked my friend Hans Rosling to come and do his magic. Rosling is a professor at Sweden's Karolinska Institute, and he has an amazing way of showing how the world has progressed in the last 150 years. The story Hans will tell you highlights the central idea we need to understand, which is that this is all less about America falling behind than the rest of the world catching up. Hans? Thank you. This is the world in 1860. Each bubble is a country. And this axis down here shows wealth, income per person, $500, $5,000, and $50,000. And this axis is health here. The length of life from 20 years all the way to 80 years. And the size of the bubbles here shows the size of the population. And the color marks the continent. The Americas blue, Europe yellow, Asia red, and Africa green. And in 1860, almost all countries were down in the poor and sick corner there. But the Industrial Revolution had started to pull Western country out of poverty. United Kingdom and Australia was leading, and U.S. was on the third place. And look what happened when I start the world here. As year passed by, the population in Western countries got better education, new discoveries helped to control infectious disease, hygiene improved, and the lifespan increased. And the West got healthy and wealthy on the same time while the rest remained in poor and sick down there and from 1900 look United States is taking the lead and becomes the engine of progress in the world through the first world war that was the Spanish flu and through the 1920s US is leading it's only during the Great Depression that US falls back temporarily and gets the lead again through the Second World War into the Cold War and we stop here 1954 at the end of the Korean War and at this time United States was on top Europe had fallen behind and Japan was trying to catch up here and interestingly a small country on the equator Singapore was just behind Latin America was in between and China and India were still down here with low life expectancy and with low incomes but they had gained their independence and look what happened after 1954 here, U.S. continue the lead, but Europe is closing in, Europe is closing in, and Japan there, they make this amazing catch-up together with Singapore and other tiger economies in Asia. And here, China and India got education, small families and health before they start this amazing economic growth, where they catch in together with more and more emerging economies, and they keep up the speed through the last economic crisis, and here we are today, 2010. And what is most interesting here is if you look at the replay, you see this very clear how the West took off first and then how the rest is following and catching up. And how will this continue? Well, let's make a projection into the future by going backwards first. This is where China was 1980. They had very low income over there, you know, and U.S. was all over here in the other end. And we never thought this would happen, that China in 30 years would move so much faster than the United States. Now, if both countries would keep the same speed in economic growth in the coming 30 years, where would the U.S. end up? It would end up there. And where would China end up? They would end up, yes, the same spot. But this is not so probable. Because when a country gets richer, the population gets older, and it's very difficult to keep the same uh, economic growth. We can see that on Japan. So a more intelligent way of looking at China is to see what has already happened today. I will split China here into its provinces. It's a huge country, and it's better to look at the provinces because they are so different. Look, Shanghai is already here. The catch-up is done. And the uh, coastal provinces are in between, and the inland prov provinces are just like other countries in Asia or Middle East or Latin America. Now, Singapore and Japan were trailblazers, and the others are coming closer. And very soon, China and India will come to a place near to you. This is fascinating, and it highlights the central idea that it's not that we're falling behind, it's that the whole rest of the world has begun to catch up. Uh, and, it, and what it suggests is that it's not so much that people are overtaking us, it's that everybody is moving into the same space, that there's a, a whole set of advanced countries, European and Asian, 
that are all converging in one space. Yes, it's the healthy, wealthy corner. That's where people want to live. I live there myself. It's a nice place. But can, can so many countries live there? Can the United States prosper with so much competition? Yes. I mean, it's more competition, but it's also more customers. So you're an optimist? No, I'm not an optimist, because that's an emotional state. I'm a possibilist. I say that it's possible if we keep peace and we keep free trade and we protect human rights, we can all live up in the healthy, wealthy corner, because in the end, that's where people want to As go. Professor Rosling just showed us, it's not that the United States is falling, it's that others are rising. But what does it mean for the long-term fortunes of the United States? After all, there have been other leading powers that face new competition, and these stories all end in decline. Harvard's economic historian, Neil Ferguson. When you look at America, uh, in a world in which China is rising, India is rising, what's your sense of where America stands in this new economic order? Well, in some ways, America stands on the edge of a cliff, uh, because great powers don't gently decline, they don't sort of fade away over decades, history shows that they very often collapse quite suddenly. They lose power quite dramatically. That, that was the experience most recently of the Soviet Union. And I think when one looks at the fiscal position of the United States with the vast explosion of debt before but particularly after the, the financial crisis, it's clear that there's a major risk. I would risk ask you a simple question. Is the United States the most powerful country in the world? Uh, is there a simple answer? Well, uh, yes, the United States is the most powerful country in the world, but we have to rethink what we mean by power. Uh, you know, the classical American narrative of the cowboy gunslinger, to put it in, uh, in the street terms, that's no longer an adequate way to think about power. But if you think about military power, yes, we'll be number one for quite some time. Think about economic power, we'll be ahead, but others are catching up. And if you think about soft power, the ability to get what you want through attraction and persuasion, we're well ahead. Let's talk about economic power for, for a bit, because even there, you tend to think that the rumors of American decline are exaggerated. Well, I think there is a, a, a great tendency to think that China has passed us. Some public opinion polls show that the majority of Americans in some polls show China is ahead of the United States. I mean, this is simply not the numbers. I mean, we're three times the size of China in purchasing power parity and, and even more if you just do exchange rates. Uh, Goldman Sachs has predicted that China's economy will equal the U.S. in size uh, sometime in the 2020s. That's probably right. Uh, if you're 1.3 million growing at 10 percent a year, that's bound to happen. Ferguson says those estimates were done before the financial crisis, but the reality is now even worse. Everything that has happened since then leads me to expect that it will be even sooner than that because the financial crisis really slowed the United States down and China, although it slowed somewhat, scarcely missed a beat and continued to grow strongly at, at rates of close to 10 percent. So my guess is that this moment uh, when China overtakes the United States will happen this decade, in the next 10 years, were the best at everything. Not only were, the were they the best at industry, they were also the best at agriculture. They were also the best at sailing. They were the best at sport. They were the best at entertainment. They were the best, of course, at empire, because they had the world's biggest empire. And yet, as early as the late 19th century, people began to feel that it was slipping away. Germany and the United States both overtook Britain in the late 19th century in terms of economic size. And from then on, really, in the 20th century, British history felt like the history uh, of decline and Once fall. again, our two Harvard professors see things through different lenses. Here's Joseph Nye. Do you think that, uh, th that there is a historical pattern here? Uh, the British Empire once ruled the world uh, and over time declined. Is, is America in Britain's place? No, I think that's uh, oversimplified. As, as one historian put it, uh, Britain ruling the world from a little island off the coast of Europe was like an oak tree in a potted palm uh, container. and It was unnatural. The United States uh, is the 
basically in demographic terms very very different from Britain and in economic scale different and in total continental size different so I think the 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 analogies with Britain are a bit oversimplified in addition there's a social structural change which is as Britain got rich the British elite wanted their young people not to become entrepreneurs but to become landed gentry in the United States it's very different uh, you want your child to go out and start up a new Silicon Valley company. Uh, you know, our best and brightest, and many of them see their path to the future is entrepreneurship. That's a source of great creativity in the American economy. So will America's entrepreneurial spirit I save I think us? if you ask the question, what is it that Americans do best? The answer is, it's still the best country in the world to have a really cool idea and turn it into a really profitable business. I still think the United States wins in that particular contest. I think Neil's right. Rather than have you meet a famous CEO of an American company with a long legacy, I thought we should meet with people who had a cool idea and are hoping to be able to turn it into a really profitable business. And the two guys you are about to meet, the founders of Foursquare, have the idea and it just might be on its way to success. Their company, which will celebrate its second birthday this month, has been valued at one quarter of a billion dollars. Foursquare reportedly grew by 3,400% in 2010. Its founders are Dennis Crowley and Naveen Salvadurai. So what is Foursquare? So with Foursquare, what we're trying to do is build applications for mobile phones that help make the world easier to explore for people. And people use Foursquare to check in at all sorts of places. I mean, you can open up um, Foursquare pretty much anywhere you are in the world, and it'll give you little tidbits of things that you should be doing nearby. So they'll check in at bars or coffee shops or whenever they go out to eat or at parks. And when they check in, we let their friends know uh, where they can so find if them. You were to, if I, someone were to say to you, the, the president or the secretary of treasury were to call you in and say, we need a lot more entrepreneurship in America, we need a lot more innovation, we need a particular um, technology. What should we do to have lots more of this kind of thing, these kinds of companies? Yeah, we've actually, we've actually been called for advice on similar things. And I think a lot of it is, it's, it's two parts. One is to educate students, youngsters, about this path in life, that you can go do something on your own. You know, and if you fail, you just start over again. Or if you fail, the steady job is waiting for you to, to, to pick you up and bring you back to where you where you could be. That strikes me as very important. In, in America, it seems as though there's no, no real cost and no social stigma to failure. Do you I, find that I, in your I industry? I totally agree, yeah. And I think the notion of failure is seen differently here in the US than in many other countries, even, even countries and in what Europe. What happens if you fail here? You just pick yourself up and try again. You know, I feel like even, <clears throat> you know, in, in my career so far, like I've been laid off and I went almost a year without working and worked on some side projects and I went to grad school and then had another year I didn't do anything and then had another project that that failed and you know we, it took us six months to get financing with yeah. Foursquare and you know people say like oh you've had all these successes so far I'm like I think they're you know we have we haven't had it yet like we're still working towards it what do you think were the the the, the features or the factors that helped make Foursquare possible uh, you know there's a there's a bunch of them like there's there's incubation labs you basically got like shared spaces where companies are are getting together five or six different companies and they're they're trading resources they're trading skill sets and they're able to make things happen and in New York we're seeing a lot of that is is funded by the city like the the space might be paid for some of the office furniture might be paid for and you know startups that normally would have to raise capital just to get something off the ground can come to these spaces for minimal costs and, and start building something so you, interacting think, with other you think government investment is helpful here I think you're seeing it in New York that it, that it, that it already works do you think that there's something about uh, uh, technology, particularly in America? I mean, why is it that I look at Germany, lots of engineers, uh, amazing technical uh, manpower, but, you know, other than SAP, there's really no great computer company to have come out of Germany. Yeah, a lot of software grew up in the U.S., right, because of the old projects like, uh, you know, DARPA and all these other things that brought the Internet to life and that brought big companies like IBM and um, everything to what it, what it is now. Um, so that culture and that history lends itself naturally to producing even more of that kind of talent and that kind of thinking. You're always around those kinds of people, so you're more likely to want to do something like them. It's interesting because even you talk about DARPA, uh, which is the Defense uh, Department's venture capital fund, and here you guys are on the kind of complete commercial edge in New York. 
yeah. but you trace your lineage back to stuff that was done by the federal government. To some degree, we, we owe a lot to what happened back then. Yeah, it's a government-funded thing that actually brought all this, right? Um, I mean, the entire internet is that story.